Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday, Tuesday, casual Tuesday, Wednesday, casual hump day, Thursday, casual Thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, December 7th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, it's Casual Friday. Also, my sister's birthday. Happy birthday, Betsy. And joining us to celebrate my sister's birthday and the end of the week, David Dayan will be in studio. Also on the program today, Bill Barr, a smarter Jeff Sessions to be nominated to the Attorney General of the United States of America. White House Chief of Sociopath John Kelly to be resigning soon. Michigan Republicans assault democracy Wisconsin style. And North Carolina's 9th Congressional District election fraud case boils over. Meanwhile, two big Mueller filings to drop later today. One on Manafort, one on Cohen. May tell us stuff, may not. And Trump to nominate a former Fox and Friends host to be the UN ambassador. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Senate confirms a new head to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau who has zero experience with consumers or financial protection. And probably bureaus, for that matter. Uh, F you, Paul LePage, says judge. Medicaid expansion will go forward. I'm not sure the judge said exactly that was those words. Written. Yep. That was a great rule. More on the postal report. And Joe Manchin creeping closer to becoming the minority leader on energy and the face of Democratic fight against climate change. And lastly, <clears throat> the biggest questions for the new house to be answered today, arguably, on uh, this version of the Majority Report. Uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is Casual Friday. It is also my sister's birthday. Once again, happy birthday, Betsy. Um David uh, Dayan is in studio with us. Uh, we will be with you in just a moment. Uh, we <laughs> it's very exciting to have you in studio. And uh, we said we, we haven't quite figured out. Well, well, hello, David. Oh, hello. Yeah. I How don't are you? Make you uh, uh, I didn't know if I was uh, ready to come on yet. I... No, you're oh, no, you're ready. Okay. Um, hey, uh, I don't know, uh, David, if you remember Rex Tillerson. I do. Yeah, he was the former Secretary of State. Uh, people are very excited that he um, he came out in public to. Um, I don't think he uh, properly maligned uh, Donald Trump, but he did it in that you know that sort of like gent- gentile way. Um, here he is uh, with Bob Schaefer of uh, CBS News. Uh, Bob Schaefer, obviously. Um, he loves these. Uh, I mean, he's also from Texas, but he's a big. Um, I don't know he has a very good relationship. It seems like with anybody who has uh, oil, um, the and the Bushes, he was good friends with. Um, and uh, here he is. Um, it's unclear to me like what event it is. I don't know some some local. I'm sure has to do with you know, uh, get rich quick scheme type of situation down there. But uh, here is uh, Bob Schieffer. Uh, and uh, Rex Tillerson talking about Donald Trump. You describe Donald Trump. (laughs) Well, most of you probably know uh, know some of this, but 
I had never met Donald Trump until the day he asked me to be Secretary of State. Pause he it. acts on his... So in other words, you know, I can't be held responsible for anything that I did. Um, I claim I have total plausible deniability, right? Like, I mean, no one knew who Donald Trump was right? Uh, until uh, at least after the inauguration. Right. I mean, really, you had no he, the guy, he just sprung it on us. It was completely, um, you know, he was as, such a kindly man from the TV. Of course, before. as as uh, as Joe and Mika said, like he always used to be in on the joke and <laughs> now. But all right, let's hear Rex Tillerson continued to try and um, uh, whitewash his culpability in this disaster. The secretary of state, he acts on his instincts in some respects that looks like impulsiveness, but. It's not his intent to act on impulse. Uh, I think <laughs> he really is trying to act on his instincts. Yes, def- well, it's challenging for me, uh, coming from the disciplined, highly process-oriented Exxon Mobil Corporation, to go to work for a man who is pretty undisciplined, uh, doesn't, doesn't like to read, doesn't read briefing reports, doesn't doesn't like to get into the details of a lot of things, but rather just kind of says, look, this is what I believe. In other words, he just makes stuff up and um, he doesn't want to be impulsive, but he doesn't have control of his impulses. So he yeah. is impulsive. Right. That is definitionally that that's impulsive. Acting without intention is, in fact, yeah. acting on impulse. You know who also strikes me as not quite as bright as we might have given him credit for? Rex Guy. Tillerson. To be fair, I, I never met him. <laughs> until never. I never heard him until just now. Until so just I can't now. Say can't say whether he's you've a complete idiot. It's judged a him in any way. way of calling somebody an effing moron. Can anybody remember the pseudonym he was using? Oh, uh, oh yeah. No. I just remembered I can't remember it. No, I don't remember. I can't that. remember it either. Wow. Was it his main breakdown with Trump, though? Wayne Tracker. Wayne uh... Tracker. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, now, uh... where was he using that pseudonym? Was he like a sock sock puppet? Going into hotels because they were, you know, his teeny boppers were after him? Why was he using a pseudonym? I can't remember what it was. He he was the one who got really upset with Trump's address to the Boy Scouts, yeah. which was That's right. a little questionable to talk about, like, you know, hot po- tubs. Like, yeah, hot tub parties with the Boy Scouts. But this guy could all know. be yours. <laughs> he used Wayne Trekker to discuss climate in emails. Oh, yeah, of course. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait for that lawsuit. Um, oh, folks, today, uh, one of our sponsors is Skillshare. And the first 500 people who go to skl.sh slash majority, and like we said, uh, now you're probably down to like 498 after we talk about it on the show. With David Dayen right now, headed right over to skl.sh slash majority, are going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library, super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online learning community. It offers courses on everything from design to video editing, mm. photography, business, technology, cooking, uh, meditation, and everything in between. There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that's going to be useful for you both in your personal and your professional life. Whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or you want to learn to do something <clears throat> excuse me, totally new. Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. I got to make a note of that. Uh, I've been checking out their courses. I, I, like I said, I, I, um, I went through the, uh, the knife cutting one because I wanted to learn, you know, like, well, there's, there's actually like you cut against the grain on certain things and the taste of food changes on how you cut it and how it cooks as to what juices comes out. All right. Yeah. It also just looks impressive when you're using a knife, right? Yes. You got to you got to go slow or you know you're going to lose. Sam's got to impress somebody. Yeah, I got to impress people mm. with my knife skills. Uh, also uh, I I I I took that uh, Google Analytics course. Um, but as soon as I just saw Photoshop, that's the next one I think I'm going to do. Get some Photoshop skills going. Uh, you can get two entire months of free access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority. 
Just think of everything you'll have at your fingertips for two whole months. I feel like you could probably go through every single video, David, uh, based I'm, upon I'm your work. I'm looking up right ethic. now, radio guest. <laughs> Again, that's skl.sh slash majority. Uh, we've got a link in the podcast description, a link on uh, the YouTube. Uh, check it out. Also, a uh, reminder, 2018 has been a difficult year for human rights, but have you ever wondered how rights abuses are documented around the world? You probably have. With the sheer volume of global crisis we're seeing from civilian casualties in Syria to ethnic cleansing in Myanmar to the caging of children on U.S. borders, it's critical that we expose the truth in order to defend the rights of all and bring those responsible to justice. Human Rights Watch does just that. They are an independent, nonprofit organization known for their accurate fact-finding, impartial reporting, and targeted advocacy, often in partnership with local activists and human rights groups. They accept no money from any government. They rely uh, on the support of informed, dedicated people just like you. So if human rights are important to you, visit hrw.org slash majority to make a donation and support its vital work around the world. When you do, not only is your gift tax deductible, it'll be matched dollar for dollar until 2019. That means your donation will go twice as far to advance justice and defend the basic dignity of people who need it most. Again, that's hrw.org slash majority. Last night, uh, we had charity night uh, for our, this we do for one night of uh, Hanukkah. Kids don't get a present. Uh, They can divide up their, the cash they would have gotten uh, amongst charities. Mm -hmm. HRW, uh, the Human Rights Watch is one of those. Um, Nicely done. Did a couple others. Box fan. We did uh, um, the Pacific Immigration Center, which we now do every year. But uh, that's a different story. Uh, so, David, um, all right, let's get to, to this uh, week in review. Um, there's yeah. a couple of things. Let's talk about the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because I know that's in your uh, wheelhouse. I want to get, obviously, to what's going on in Michigan and, well, um, mm-hmm. Uh, Michigan and in Wisconsin, we spoke to Ari Berman earlier in the week, um, and things have simply progressed at, uh, on the same trajectory. But we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But let's talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because um, this was, up until about two years ago, considered by many to be one of the most successful agencies. I don't know if in the history of the U.S. government, but. But certainly in modern times, and because because of the way that it was financed, right? I, I mean, and and, and personnel. I, tell us why. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the financing, and the, and the point of that is that it was not financed through congressional appropriations, so it couldn't be. You couldn't have the money spigot turned off. It was it was uh, funded through the Federal Reserve, which guaranteed its its resources. Um, I think more so the reason that uh, CFPB has been successful is because of sort of the way the agency was imagined. This is an agency with a mission that is entirely and singularly to protect consumers. Um, Previously, these laws that it has jurisdiction and oversight over were put into agencies that had other missions, safety and soundness of the banks, uh, things like that. And uh, they were sort of at cross purposes with this mission of you know, making sure consumers are getting a fair shake on these very important financial transactions. And it's probably designed that way on some level, right? That Absolutely. It's sort of like a, uh, like a mitigating, like a built-in – right. Like the the critique is built into the uh, right. into the product, and so you're weighing the you know those two missions, and 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 usually it comes out on the side of the the, the group with the most money and right. the most power and influence. Uh, this was di- distributed differently, and was also staffed differently. I mean, as you recall, for the first year, uh, Elizabeth Warren was uh, the person who stood up this agency, and she built the organizational chart. Uh, she uh, created the ways in which the priorities were were made for this agency. She staffed the agency uh, at the very beginning. A lot of those people are, you know, were still there through the first term of uh, Richard Cordray, uh, who was sort of the hand-picked uh, uh, director. And so all of those things, I think, came together. It was seen as a new agency. It was it was vibrant. It brought people in who had a public service mission. 
Um, so there were a lot of reasons why uh, there were, uh, you know, it was set up for success. Uh, and it was successful to a degree. I mean, I don't want to overstate it. There were some things I think that CFPB did where they they kind of kept their powder dry, pulled their punches a little bit in rulemaking. But uh, generally a successful agency um, until last Thanksgiving when uh, Richard Cordray left to unsuccessfully run for governor of Ohio. And uh, Mick Mulvaney, who was uh, moonlighting, he, he was the director of, he was the White House budget director, who would come in three days a week to uh, screw up the CFPB. Uh, much he easier the when you're screwing something up. It's much easier to yeah, do to be it a short just timer. Three days a week, you can be you can... like a you know nine to three banker. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, go out in the golf course after you uh, destroy uh, this agency. Steal. A I, I mean, on some it. level, I mean, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but on some level, that is the entire sort of conservative project, right? And you get into government, destroy it, right. and it's, you, you, it's so hard to be incompetent at being incompetent. <laughs> like, I mean, if you're... <laughs> Not quite, though, because I've actually heard from some people that uh, Mulvaney... I mean, we talk about Kathy Craninger. She's the uh, woman who was uh, uh, confirmed yesterday and how she has no consumer protection experience whatsoever. And that's absolutely true. But it's not like Mulvaney did, right? right. I mean, he was, he was a congressman. He had no executive agency uh, experience before this. He was a budget director. That's a very different thing than consumer financial protection. I'm not sure he was even on the Financial Services Committee uh, in Congress. Uh, he was certainly a critic of CFPB, but that was mainly because of, you know, who was coming into right. his office. Um, so he actually did not know the mechanisms by which he could, particularly on rulemaking, how he could undo those rules. Uh, so he would say to people in the office, hey, I want to get rid of this payday rule. And they'd be like, yeah, all right. And then they just kind of wouldn't do it. Right. Um, so on rulemaking, it ha he has not been quite as successful. <laughs> Where um, Mulvaney was very successful is in enforcement. Right. Uh, and, you know, the Washington Post this week put out a, a pretty long article showing that enforcement was down 75 percent. Uh, it took several months for any enforcement actions to be brought by the agency. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's this thing that the Washington Post attributed to people at the agency, but I wrote it six months earlier, uh, called the Mulvaney discount. And the Mulvaney discount is these, uh, various enforcement actions where there would just be a reduction in the penalty. That's the easiest thing to do, right? You get, exactly. you, you get it comes on your desk and it's like sign off on this, uh, $300 million penalty. And you go, you know what? Drop this down to 25. Yeah, exactly. That's what call this. And that's exactly what was done. Uh, uh, on up till today, you know, I, I... Was there an algorithm or was it just, <laughs> he just picked a number he liked? I, you know, I mean, literally... 90% reduction. Literally, they would say in the uh, enforcement documents that, uh, well, initially we wanted $6 million, but the we don't feel like this company that ripped off people has the ability to pay that. So we're going to drop it to 200000 I mean, that's oh, almost fair. verbatim in, wow. in some of these documents. Uh, going on up to yesterday, you know, the day that Craninger gets uh, confirmed, uh, CFPB did an enforcement action against State Farm Bank, the insurance company, but they also have a bank. And it was about uh, credit reporting errors. They would report to credit reporting agencies incorrect information about customers. Well, that's not a big deal for you to get a, <laughs> uh, a reduced credit score. Right. I mean, so much for the house or the car that you wanted or uh, the loan for, to help your kid go to school or whatever it is. So they reported this incorrect information, never corrected it, uh, uh, were, were delayed in, in actually getting that information out uh, uh, and finally reversing it, uh, ruined credit scores. And the enforcement action, uh, and I'm, I'm not... Being hyperbolic, this was the enforcement action. Promise not to do it again. <laughs> it was zero did they dollars. Even, did they have to do that in writing, or they just in writing? The oh, compliance. Well, okay. You know, there's okay. compliance around not doing it again. Uh, zero dollars in fines. Zero dollars in restitution to these people who had their credit scores ruined. Wow. Uh, and and that was the enforcement. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a sense that 
oh, Cranny's just coming in. She has no experience. She's just going to ruin the ages. Ruin it from what? I mean, you know, right. Mulvania's already uh, uh, well, really they do done seem the to have a scheme to do this. But, uh, but let me just also interject um, the you from your perspective, right? There's no punishment for that agency. But I think uh, libertarian philosophy tells us right. that, of course, consumers will stop going to that agency because they did this, to, to and State they'll Farm go Bank. out of uh, yeah. State Farm Bank. They yeah. will go out of business. Now. Right. So you'll never see State Farm commercials anymore. Right. State yeah. Farm Bank Look will go that. out of business yeah. because why would people? Uh, uh, you know, why would anybody use them if they it's, were doing that? It's the discipline of the market. Uh, is yeah. what you're talking Com- about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, I should just add, I'm being facetious. <laughs> um, there, 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 there was a half so, dozen people out there. So, Craninger gets uh, confirmed. Uh, yes, she obviously thanks is, to Susan is Collins, woefully unqualified. A fifty to forty nine decision. So, all Democrats voted against this, uh, and only uh, and I guess Tom Tillis was absent yesterday for some reason or another, which means it was fifty forty nine. So, any one of the Republicans. Uh, could have voted the other way, and she would not have Because even confirmed. if Mike Pence came down to vote, right? 50, no, 50-49, it wouldn't have met. I mean, if Tillis is gone— Oh, he's got to break a tie. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay. So right. if it was 49-50, right. nomination fails. Now, there is a sense that um, it's not necessarily a good thing that Craninger has been confirmed, but uh, consider the alternative. So um, Mulvaney's there in an interim capacity. This is a five-year term, and it's independent of who is in the White House. So uh, Craninger is nominated, is confirmed today, December 2018. She it has a five-year term, will be there till December 2023, which means the, regardless of, you know, whoever gets uh, becomes president in 2020. Oh, that's so depressing. Uh, Craninger is allowed to be there. Now, she's... Uh, you know, there is a, a attempt, a possibility to do a four-cause uh, removal of the CFPB director. Like you're obviously, not doing your job? Obviously uh, never been done before right. uh, because it's a, you know, a new agency. But, uh, you know, that's an option. You know, if you have a President Warren, maybe, maybe she tries to do something like that. Um, but uh, it's a little dice. I mean, y- you don't know if that's going to happen. So... But at the very least, but the, uh, but president Democrat who might win in 2020 will have the opportunity to appoint someone as opposed to if this had gone five years. It, it, it well, uh, but think about the alternative. So think about what if they, you know, uh, the courts decide, well, no, you can't. This isn't a cause. You can't fire them. So right now, Cranger's there till December 2023. If they voted her down. And Mulvaney just stays there and and does the the lack of enforcement he's doing, and they don't fill it uh, until the end of Trump's right. turn. Then it's five, you know, it's another couple right. of years right. out. Right. So there was a, a a school of thought that yeah, let's confirm this person as quick as we can to get her out of there. Right. It almost would have been better to do this a year ago because yeah. you just want to get it over as quickly as possible instead of. Uh... That, that's a school of thought, but you know, I mean, you can you can see it both ways. I okay. Suppose. Let's just, before we move on to a different topic, Mick Mulvaney is saying that according to the charter, essentially, of this agency, yeah. that its name is not really the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It is the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. Financial Protection. Yes. yes. Uh, now, this is, story. this is nuts. So he wants to change it to reflect the real name, which is going to require all of these companies, uh, financial entities that file with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to refile with the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, right? And at a cost of somewhere around three hundred million dollars. There to- was uh, just to be clear, there was a CFPB report that was put out to say what is the effect of the name change, both on the agency. Uh, which obviously has lots of forms and and, right. and things and, you know, moving the, the B number from the beginning to the end. What's amazing about this is that he's literally taking consumers and not putting them first. I mean, that's right. literally what he's doing by doing that. Um, so 
so they did this report to show, you know, how much is this going to cost the agency and then how much is it going to cost the firms who then have to do all these changes in their databases, changes in their compliance forms and things like that. And yes, what they showed is that it would cost the agency $19 million just to change the name. And it would cost regulated firms, regulated by the agency, up to $300 million. And the purpose of this is to uh, show how bad this agency is, right? Like that it's making people, it's causing unnecessary waste. Yes, you, uh, there's a sense that that's the point. Like it, it, the point is to cost $300 million to show how how silly it is. But it, there's also just this like bizarre, like, well, actually what I found is that the, they've been naming it wrong. These stupid liberals have named it wrong this entire time. Mm. Uh, it's just bizarre. Um, Elizabeth Warren's bad at naming things. But, but I mean, I think the idea is— By the is, way, Mick Mulvaney is—Mick is not his name. Mick is a nickname. His name is John Michael Mulvaney, and he's saying, this is ridiculous that we're not using but, the statutory real name but it's of not, the Consumer but it, but Financial it's not, But it's not—he's not doing this out of, like, some type of uh, OCD. He's doing this because they want to further— create animosity towards the agency and create an argument that this is an agency that's out of control and it's bad, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is sort of like, it seems to me, equivalent to the the way that uh, a Republican Congress deals with the postal o- office, right? right? It's like, you have no control over what you're doing. We're going to impose upon you certain obligations. You're going to have to pay out. Uh, you're you're going to have to fully fund your pensions, system uh, in your healthcare system for a 75 year horizon to pay for postal workers retirement right. for postal workers who aren't even born yet. Right. It has to be fully paid. Right. There's no other entity maybe in the world that, it, that, 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 that imposes that requirement on themselves or is imposed on that. Right. And it doesn't give the postal service an ability to, to deal with it. It's just a way to inhibit and, and kneecap a, them. There's a somewhat alternate point in that Mulvaney's argument has been that CFPB is out of control. They have gone well beyond their statutory objectives. Nobody's reading the statutory language except me, John Michael Mulvaney, and uh, they have they have overreached beyond the legislative intent. So what he's really saying is, you have so ignored the legislative intent of this agency that you did, you're not even naming it right. See here in this in this language that you've never read. That it's wrong. The, the irony is that the Dodd-Frank Act refers to the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection and also refers to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in different parts of the statute. So, the same thing so there's CFPB way. sometimes and there's BCFP uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, under Mulvaney's standard, he could not uh, sort of, for example, the agency is called CFPB in the context of putting the director on the uh, board of the FDIC. So under what Mulvaney's saying, if it's called the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, he couldn't, couldn't be, be on, on the, the FDIC, FDIC board, right? right? So if you're going to be that literal. Right, and, okay. exactly. All right, well, let's talk about the postal uh, office because there was a okay. postal report put out. This is We're, we're hitting all of the, the stuff that— the most boring stuff. Well, it's not most—well, uh, it, it's a little bit drier. But, I mean, this stuff is, is hugely relevant, and it, uh, people can't get this information uh, anywhere else. The only, the only way they could do it is read your, your, your Tumblr, and I, my understanding is that's going away because of the porno thing. <laughs> so um, I will not use eggplant emojis anymore. Uh, wait, let's, what? Let's uh, just say I'm, that. What's happening? What? T- Tumblr has a new rule about getting rid of uh, adult content, and, and oh, I made for, a joke okay. about that. Sorry, I didn't know anything uh, about David that. Sorry, Dayan. Matt. Okay. Basically, all the stuff remaining on Tumblr. Right, exactly. Okay. And David Dayan's uh, basically home for his clearinghouse of his, of, his, uh, of his reported his pieces. Side links, which, uh, links. you know. I mean, they've, they've been uh, – Tumblr's been flagging things like, you know, Taylor Swift sitting on a chair. Like, we don't know. We don't know. This, right. this could violate our Sam, adult. There was that. a flag on the postal report. You're but, into that, right? Sam? All right, yeah. Oh, totally. It's Taylor Swift sitting um, on a chair. All right, well, let's, so let's talk about the postal report, and then we'll get to uh, what's going on in Michigan and Wisconsin. Right. And, and a little bit, I, I also want to talk about what's happening in the House. But um, the postal report came out. Who commissioned the report? What were the purposes? This was it? a Trump executive order. So Trump put an executive order to start a task force on the future of the U.S. Postal Service, 
which uh, has been losing money um, uh, for a variety of different reasons that we'll go into. You mentioned one of them. The, that's the biggest one. The isn't pre-funding it? reasons. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what? But for that, they would they would be still you know on the road to profitability, if not profitable. Uh, but you know, I mean, you know, uh, email has has degraded right, of the ability of, of the postal service to continue. Um, so this was a task force to uh, determine. And now a, a lot of people saw it in the context of Trump going after Amazon, saying they were cheating the postal service, that they were uh, underpaying for package delivery uh, through the parcel uh, post program. And uh, so this was a task force designed to create recommendations. For the Postal Service, it was seen at the time as sort of a stalking horse for privatization, which we've seen around the world at several postal services. Uh, they've privatized their, their agencies. Uh, I would say in the U.S., w- w- the Postal Service is a partially privatized agency. It does not get any money from the U.S. government outside of very, some very minuscule things for government uh, uh, postage. Um, it, is, it has a board that's appointed by the uh, president— uh, and confirmed by the Senate, but uh, they kind of have independent uh, uh, with some some statutory uh, uh, restrictions, but they kind of independent uh, government governance. Uh, and uh, so the, and for the question most part, was don't get taxpayer uh, money, no, no, zero uh, dollars. It's all. And from the so the question was, you know, was this task force going to recommend privatization? Completely. And it didn't actually recommend privatization, but it recommended something, I think, much worse. Really? Uh, And that is uh, the degrading of the universal service obligation. Now, what is the universal service obligation? That means neither sleet nor snow nor dead of night will keep us from reporting rounds. It means that everyone in the country, every residence, every business, no matter where you are, no matter how much it costs to get there— gets mail uh the the furthest reaches of alaska the most rural area in south dakota wherever uh you're going to get your mail and you're going to get it six times a week and you're going to get a standard rate for letters from any part of the country to another uh standard rate for for packages and things like that that's the universal service obligation and what the report said is that we need to redefine the universal service <laughs> obligation. They would, they Those are ex- my favorite universes, wh- which <laughs> don't include all of the universe. <laughs> They're the, much easier to manage. Yes, that's right. Um, and there, you know, there's some contradictions in the report, because the report says that the one thing we don't want to do is hurt rural Americans who uh, re- rely on the Postal Service, especially because the digital divide is still right. pretty large. Um, but in practice, uh, all of the things that it wants to do, which is they, they want to sort of define essential services. So like person-to-person correspondence, bill paying, government mail, uh, transport of pharmaceuticals for, for some reason is in there. Uh, those things would be essential services. That would still be universal. Everything else, like commercial packages, like from Amazon – uh, would be inessential and then subject to increased rates and also potentially subject to discontinuance of delivery. Uh, the, the, the term they use is exiting the business line. Uh, so they could – certain packages are like, I'm not going to middle of Alaska with that package. You can't do it in the Postal Service. So that would be and, – and who would that fall on? Right, it would fall on rural. Of customers. course, because uh, it's going to be most expensive right. to go to a rural customers, and this is really fundamentally competition would start kicking in. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Competition would start kicking in, and they w- and then you would right. see just already even by more the way, people not go there. Already, UPS and FedEx don't deliver to certain places. There's uh, if FedEx has a thing called a delivery area area surcharge, where if it's a, a hard to get area, they add money to to deliver to that particular. Locality, so uh, that's what you would see—a two-tiered system, basically. And, and, say, and that is—that yeah. I mean—that is among other issues. That is one of the fundamental uh, problems with privatization of the postal service: is that it is simply not profitable to do. And and I don't know if you've seen any numbers to this effect, but there is probably ten to fifteen percent, maybe more, of what the post office does that almost cannot be profitable. 
Right. Like, you cannot have delivery service to the farthest regions of the the uh, the, and, the country and make it profitable. And when you're thinking about that, you have to think in terms of what is the postal service for? Is it for making money for itself and for the United States, or is it to, as it says in the statute, bind the nation together? Right. It, it the the whole point is to you know give everybody the ability to acquire information conduct commerce no matter where you live no matter who you are no discrimination against any member of society you can use the postal service now you know in the 1800s it was much more uh, you know much more vital part of communication this is why you know magazines and 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 newspapers have a reduced rate of delivery right. uh, relative to the, uh, the the other other parts of packages and, and, and mail. But, you know, even today, particularly in these rural areas, it, it's, it's incredibly important to have reliable mail service. And if you're saying to an area— Particularly because they don't have um, the, the same broadband of, that's of right. the internet. Because now, all of a sudden, the sort of the—, the the digital divide adds to if, if you were to uh, diminish postal service, the, the the divide that exists in terms of, of information because of the digital divide becomes that much even steeper, like uh, and right. in, in, uh, in disparate. So while this didn't call for privatization, it embraces the logic of privatization. Right. The logic of we have to turn a profit, we have to uh, cover our costs on everything. That we do every little business line uh, that we that we engage in. If if a Democratic president ever called for a report like this, I mean, a, a, a report like this was produced during a, a Democratic administration. First off, I, I, I would be upset because it's fundamentally contrary to some of the the, the points right. of having a Democrat in office. But um, the New York Times would be writing about how um, the coastal elites. Right. Um, think uh, that the heartland people and rural people are are not worth uh, expending any money on. This would be uh, this would be a huge like we would hear this in the Senate. This would be the war on Christmas, right? It would be yeah. the war on rural people. Uh, but because it comes out of the Trump administration, right? Nothing. And by the way, I, I mean it goes further than just not delivering certain packages. Uh, uh, it says that. It should be easier to close post offices. And where are those post offices going to be closed? There are 31,000 locations in rural areas where it's unprofitable. Yes. Uh, It it talks about uh, slowing down the speed of processing mail in places where it's unprofitable. Uh, So maybe you can get your mail in a rural area, but it'll be once a week instead of six days a week. Going back to the Pony Express. Yeah. What about uh, drones? And <laughs> you guys are anti-future. <laughs> um, and then it, it talks about raising. You know how can how can we make the postal service cover its costs? You know uh, revenue enhancement uh, options. And it talks about like hunting licenses and fishing licenses. You can well, sell at the post office. But it it specifically says no banking. Yes, it specifically says. It, it uh, expanding, I'll, I'll quote here, expanding in the sectors where the USPS does not have a comparative advantage or where balance sheet risk might arise, such as postal banking, should not be pursued. Now, uh, for folks who, um, who are new to the show, wow. it, it, if you would listen to the show uh, in like uh, 2014 or 15, yeah. um, you would have heard... Uh, probably more about postal banking than in any other <laughs> medium uh, that existed except for print. It, it uh, is why your audience was cut in half exactly, during that era. Exactly. And uh, had um, Hillary Clinton won, uh, this would have been all postal banking all the time. <laughs> right. um, but uh, just briefly remind people why this would be such a great idea. Right. So uh, in the United States, um, there are significant amounts of people who have little or no access to banking services. Uh, either they don't, they don't have the ability to get a bank account at all, or they have one, but they also use all these alternative sources like pawn shops or payday lenders or whatever. And uh, those services charge extortionate rates. Uh, the average is something like, I think it was $2,500 a year 
uh, in interest and fees on these alternative financial services for the average family. And these are families making $25,000 a year. Right. This is it's like insane. 10% of right. their total income just on fees for conducting, you know, being part of the financial system. And in a modern economy, if you're not part of the financial system, you right. can't get a job or rent a car. Or, I mean, there's so many things you can't do. So the idea would be to go back to something we had in from 1911 to 1967, where the post office provided a postal savings account uh, that anyone could access uh, that would give you the ability to have uh, an ATM card uh, that would give you the ability to conduct uh, financial transactions. And uh, it would be a way to, to promote financial inclusion, which is squarely within the mission of the U.S. Postal right. Service to bind, bind the, the nation, nation together. Right. Uh, so uh, this would not only help a little bit on the Postal Service's finances, you, can, you could charge vastly less for you know, lending services or things like that in terms of interest. Uh, so families would save 80%, 90% in fees and interest, but uh, the Postal Service would make a little bit of money and, more important, promote financial inclusion. After Medicare for All, that's my uh, that's, that's my, number two. That's number two on number my two. Uh, my bucket list. But of, uh, this task force said no, can't do that. Well, do but that. this task force just is. I mean, it's just going to be operative during the Trump years, right? I mean, theoretically, right? Right. right. But I mean, the logic of it, I think, is going to endure to a certain extent. I hope so. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, the House. The um, there's two things I want to talk about. What, okay. Where are we on the um, the and I think it was uh, you, one of your buddies over at The Intercept, uh, Ryan Grimm, mm-hmm. who wrote about uh, progressives getting on to, you know, getting 40 percent. Oh, you wrote that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. When in that. doubt, just assume. I, you just assume, you know, it's you. But then, uh, OK, so you wrote this piece where the Democrat, the progressive caucus, and we sp- spoke about it on the show a couple we weeks did. ago. OK. What's the latest on that? Anything new? Okay, so just to AOC refresh, is going for the. Um, that's what it was. Ways and means. Yeah, yeah. Grim, Ryan wrote about that. Right about that. Okay. So, um, yeah, the latest is that the Progressive Caucus, as we talked about, made a uh, deal with Nancy Pelosi. They used their power because Pelosi needs almost every Democrat to vote for her on the floor of the House on January third in order to become Speaker. Have you heard anything to the effect that she doesn't have that? Well, I haven't heard definitively that she does have 218 okay. votes, but uh, she, I think she's moving in that direction. Okay. Uh, but at the time, a few weeks ago, it was a little bit less clear, and she needed to, you know, sort of give give members who were wary, uh, you know, little chits. Right. And one of them that the Progressive Caucus secured was proportional representation on these so-called money committees. Uh, and what are the money committees? Ways and means— uh, which does tax policy, right. energy and commerce, which does health care and climate change and a host of other things, uh, financial services, which obviously does uh, banking and housing policy, and appropriations, which is all the money uh, and where it, is, where it goes in, in the various parts of the government. Those committees all have less than 40 percent representation for the Progressive Caucus. The Progressive Caucus is around 40 percent of the entire Democratic caucus. So uh, there was a deficiency there, and and the co-chairs of the caucus, Mark Pocan and Pramila Jayapal, said, we, we want to up that. We, right. uh, they were running into a problem, and the problem was that they couldn't find as many people as they needed to get onto these committees. The newer members were, they just kind of didn't know the importance of these committees. Uh, in, in the piece, there was a quote from Alex Lawson who said to me, uh, progressives come to Congress to change the world, and new Democrats and centrists come to Congress to get on the Ways and Means Committee. Right. Like, they they, they are very hyper-targeted. It's like a cultural, almost a cultural uh, predisposition against these things. Exactly. So uh, progressives have 75% of the Judiciary Committee. That's, like, kind of where they hang out, like cliques at the, you know, the tables and lunch. Uh, So, and then with existing members, the problem was that they have their own committees. And these exclusive committees uh, are supposed to be things that you can't also serve on a different committee. 
on. So if you're he's, on Ways and almost, Means, you shouldn't. You're not allowed necessarily to serve on another committee. And there's a certain dynamic here that is uh, similar to what we're seeing in the in the Senate mm-hmm. regarding Joe Manchin's ascension to the to energy the committee. energy commission sort of the the ranking minority or really the the minority leader on that on that right. uh, committee and that that seems like it's going to happen it's a separate um yeah. uh, issue but the dynamic is similar insofar as um you need people to come in and either give up seniority on another committee right. and come into another committee where they wouldn't necessarily have the same they start at uh, the ground floor exactly. and and so all this seniority and and you know the congress runs on seniority you want a subcommittee chairmanship you want a committee chairmanship you got to put in the time and if i'm fighting for climate change let's say I want to be on that energy committee, I, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, well, but if I'm fighting for, I, I want to be on the energy committee. Well, I, I guess maybe there, you want to be on the natural resources. Yeah. If you're into armed services, you know, if you're you're in the foreign and affairs, part of this is tied to what their constituency wants, or what they perceive their constituency wants, or their, what their brand is, right. and what it's easier for them to brand themselves, or where they're getting funding and whatnot. And on some level, there's a certain amount of reeducation that has to happen. Right. For the House members and how they can communi- re-educate their constituents and right. say, like, hey, this is important. It has value to you right. that I'm on this committee. Right. And so it was, it was, you know, there was some difficulty. I think it's sort of moving through. One thing that happened, so Barbara Lee uh, lost this this leadership race against Hakeem Jeffries. Look at Michael. He's The Democratic chair. No, I know. It's annoying. So, Na- so Nancy Pelosi gives Barbara Lee— a seat on the what is called the Steering and Policy Committee. And w- she actually opened a third seat for a third co-chair. There were already two chair- co-chairs. That's, she made a third co-chair for Barbara Lee. So she's taking power away from those other two existing ones. And, and giving it to Barbara Lee. Who are the other what ones? is this? Uh, uh, Rosa, Rosa DeLauro Rosa and Eric Swalwell, who are like loyalists to, to Pelosi. What does that committee do? It makes the committee assignments. It recommends uh, uh, the members and where they go. It builds the seating chart uh, for what members go on what committees. So this is giving a progressive icon who all the, the progressives, or many of them at least, supported uh, the, the ability to have a, a seat at the table to build out that committee. So that's important. The second thing is this uh, AOC thing. So Ryan wrote about this. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was linked to a couple different committees, but now she's zeroed in on the Ways and Means Committee, the Tax Writing Committee. Now, uh, there's this weird custom that someone from New York City has to be on the Ways and Means Committee. I, I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it is, but a member representing New York City must be on the Ways and Means Committee. Previously, the member from New York City that served on that committee was Joe Crowley. So AOC is making the argument, that's well, spot. that's my spot. I beat him. I want that seat. There's another member who is angling for it, and that's Tom Swozy, who is a part of Queens and then Long Island. Uh, yeah. yeah, more Long Island. Uh, much I'm, more I'm, Long I'm, Island. I'm, I'm like a piece of right, Queens, right, but right. much more Long Island. Queens is Long Island. Let's be honest. Well, Not but it's, it's, it's part of the, of the city. Audience. It's part of the city. Yeah, but Queens. Part of the, the, yeah, I know, but Sorry. we're we're we're, we're, we're going to get technicality here. Cool, On a technicality, blah. he is he represents New York right. City uh, uh, at some level. Um, so he's also gunning for that seat. Uh, so it's it's the choices between AOC. It's almost the perfect sort of like metaphor microcosm for all of it, right? Right. In, in terms of the Democratic I Party, I think Hakeem Jeffries and Barber. Lee was up there too, as far as a microcosm. Conflict. Yeah, uh, I, I think so. I mean, but th- that is, in that instance, it's you know their fellow members voting for them, sure. and some doing it under the auspices of misinformation that was put out there by Joe Crowley about yes. what, the idea that Barbara Lee wrote story. about that as well. well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, you, you wrote about that. I did not yeah. write. Ryan oh. wrote about that, okay. but apparently he, yeah, go Joe ahead. Crowley told. A significant um, number of members of the caucus that Barbara Lee had contributed to AOC's campaign in the primary. Well, I think he just said she contributed, and then people drew their own conclusions. And they were like, well, we're not going to vote for right. uh, leadership who's, who's willing to use their leadership power 
to take out incumbents right. because and, everybody and, is self-interested. And so the truth was – that she, she did it after she won after, the primary, right. like Steny Hoyer, like just every like everybody other, else, like everybody else did. Right. God, it's like all the bad parts of Leninism and none of the good parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so she, thought, she did call Joe Crowley a white devil. Uh, that was. Man. <laughs> yeah. I um, what what I do does it re- say? Oh wait, I said that. Was that on bad. the floor? Yeah, she no, said this devil. But that I mean that is holding the seat um, from this. Brave young yellow woman. And, and, and you get the sense that uh, Pelosi was not happy with, with, with the way that, that that vote turned out. Well, I mean, it is interesting that she then felt the need to compensate. But that, that is also caucus management. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it was, a, it was a, a close race. But she wouldn't have done the same thing with Hakeem Jeffries. I don't know. Maybe she would have. I don't know. I, don't, I, 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 don't I just know. don't get that sense. I, 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 maybe she would have. But I, but I think that like she knew there was there there, the Hakeem Jeffries vote I think caused her more problems than it would have if Lee had won, um, and I, that's I think that's, that's fair. That's my sense. But um, and l- briefly, let's just talk about uh, for a moment the Joe Manchin. How effed up is that? <laughs> what is wrong with Chuck Schumer? Well, uh-huh. is it is it uh-huh. is it Chuck Schumer? I mean, so it's the Baileys. <laughs> the as we said. This whole thing runs on seniority. The Congress runs on seniority. And uh, so the, the precipitating event is Cantwell, right? So Cantwell uh, is taking over a, a different committee. Right. I'm not sure which committee, but she, she wants to take over a different committee. And that opens up a spot on this energy committee. And there are three members who are on the committee who have seniority over Mansion. But they all already chair their own – or ranking member on their own committees. So Wyden already is ranking member on the finance committee. Bernie Sanders – And you can only member. be ranking member on one committee. That's correct. Bernie Sanders already on the budget committee. Stabenow already on agriculture. So you tick them off, and the next one on the list is Manchin, right? Uh, and yes, uh, environmentalists are apoplectic about this. At first, I think there was a lot of, uh, there, at least on you know uh, anti Bernie Twitter, there, there there was a lot of blame for Bernie. Oh. Well, because that, the because Politico wrote this was a Politico or somebody wrote this piece that framed it as if it was Bernie Sanders' fault, right, um, right. as opposed to. But from I my love perspective, Joe look, first off, common sense leadership. Here's why it's Schumer's. Here's why it's Schumer's problem. Okay, because Schumer is the leader of the Senate, right? A, at least the Democrats in the Senate, leader. and the idea. That you are going to kneecap the Democrats by a, just from a rhetorical standpoint on climate change, like you're going to put one of the biggest advocates for coal, short of Mitch McConnell, on this committee, um, who incidentally is not just, you know, I don't even give him credit for being an earnest supporter of coal. I think he's just bought. And um, I'm actually just super corrupt. Yeah, exactly. I don't. <laughs> I mean, it would be deep in my bones. <laughs> it's deep in my bones. Who this I is am. Just really, just about. I'll tell you what, Jenks. It, <laughs> did you ever and, see that interview with him and Jank Uger? I know I always mention it, but the question on Yemen is still the best piece of spin the, I've ever seen in my life. He's like, "Why would you want to four Democrats?" This was another Yemen vote a year ago. Like, why would you want to four Democrats that voted not to suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia? And he's like, "You know what, Jenks? I think that." We could do a lot more to monitor the civilian casualties over there if we're participating in it. <laughs> I don't trust the Europeans to have the same kind of oversight. Now, I'll tell you what. When you're think, riding shotgun, you can tell what you've run over. No, exactly. He's literally – he's like, I think a civilian casualty is more like killing innocent children is what's more like. He <laughs> literally <laughs> – I was like, that guy's guy. So I'm, yeah. so I'm looking – I mean, so you, so you say, well, what, what can Schumer do about it? Well, so I'll tell you what Schumer do. Here's what he can do. You, so I'm oh. looking at at mansions. I like, I like how David Dame literally has like. No, I'm no, looking no. at mansions. I have the actual list of literally <laughs> what he could do. I'm looking at mansions committee assignments. Right. So Manchin sits on appropriations. You're not going to be able to kick out someone in appropriations and give him that. Uh, he's on intelligence. And he's on veterans affairs. So I, I'm not sure exactly at the moment who is the ranking member on veterans affairs. It used to be Sanders. I don't know who right. it is now. But you could work a compromise yeah. and say, tell you what, Joe, you, you get veterans. You've got tons of veterans in West Virginia. Yep. We will give you the ranking membership of the Veterans Affairs Committee. It's a high profile 
assignment, a lot of bipartisanship. That'll, that'll help you back home. And we'll give somebody else the energy committee. That's, that's what a, uh, a, that's what a minority a leader, leader would, would do. do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That I'll is tell you what, point. Chuck. That's a mighty. That's a real good uh, Jew negotiating tactic. But I see a lot of right. campaign is this slander against me right now. Slander against me? <laughs> no, I think no. Uh, but this is the, this is this is my point. But this he is, doesn't. He's not going to give up. No, energy. Chuck. No, there's but, way too much money to raise. Well, look, energy. there's plenty of money for him to raise there. But the thing is, is that Sander. I mean, that Schumer can also like he can say, "Here's the here's the carrot, and I have a stick." Because we don't need you, Joe. We're in the we're in the minority now by by four. Like you know, like you're, you're deserting us. No longer has the uh, power that it did, you know, uh, six months ago. Well, to be fair, he he's got to he's got to think about no. when uh, there's a fifty fifty split and uh, the vice president uh, O'Rourke or whoever is casting the deciding vote in two years. I mean, you know. It's not that easy to no, be the leader of a Senate caucus, but I, there is a way. You just give them Veterans Affairs. Yes, and, and or you go to uh, someone else, you know, so some other you know senator, and say, like, look, if you if you want to be in the minor, if you want to be in uh, the majority, we're going to have to do things that are going to help the brand. It is going to be very problematic to go out there, particularly with a lot of young people right. who are going to, you know, the next uh, presidential nominee, well, whoever it is, is going to be out there talking about the urgency of climate change. And we're going to look to the Senate and we're going to have a guy who literally is a coal, like, like just like, yeah, coal shoveling coal money. And, and not to jump on Sanders, but he's the natural guy who you would say. But give it up for the team. Unless, take the budget unless you're away. Sanders and you're thinking there's a 50 50 chance. I'm not going to be here, but I'm not going to be but here. But if you're running on, I think, I don't think it's going to be majorly problematic for him in any way. But, you know, the guy this week did a two hour, you know, uh, uh, a streaming uh, uh, thing on, on the Green New Deal. If, if there's any way in which he can be someone who say, I'm going to step up and I'm going to take over this committee because I'm going to run on climate change in 2020. He doesn't know he that he's going to run yet. That's the problem. And you know, and also what's happening. He doesn't here, know that they, he's going to run. I, he thinks, think, I think he's almost definitely going to run, but I think this is a coordinated attack. Is it? David Dane is I doing did. with well, other pro Well, I was going to get to that. Yeah, I was yeah, going to get right. to that. There's but, no but doubt what's going on. I think, I think the fact that he won't take this is indicative that he doesn't know yet. That he's going to run. He may end up running. He may end up not. But I don't think he knows right now. Because if he did, if you have to bet money. He, what would you go with, though? If I, I mean, had to bet like, money if, yeah. at this point, I would think. I would think now, Problem. really, in the wake of like, um, you know, what happened with Elizabeth Warren. We're the, talking the sort DNA of, gate. Yeah, oh, that okay. that I think I think from a political standpoint, the the mess, the takeaway from that was like, she's not staffed properly. Her political team is not is not you know up to up to par, and I think from Sanders' perspective, it's like if he thought that she could win, um, I think he would step down. I wanted to sit I think this one would, out. But he would sit it out. This, but so. I think honestly, yeah. and so I but I don't think he knows now because I think if he did know, then he would do that maybe and get by uh, Schumer another two years. I don't know that he would do it if he did if he did know necessarily because I I don't know that Bernie thinks that way. In terms of like, uh, I think he likes being. On, uh, first of all, I like think he likes being ranking member of the budget committee, even though it's 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 not that important a committee in the grand scheme of things. But he gets to talk about every part of the budget, which means he gets to talk about all of his domestic policy at once. Uh, so that's number one. Um, and I just think you know he's not weedy like that. I, and this is, this is a weird issue, right? Right. The, the, about seniority and things like that. And it, it's just sort of popped up. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe he will come around and, and, and do that. But I, I ultimately, I think Schumer is the one who needs to forge the compromise. <laughs> do you know who the Baileys are? The, uh, yes. The, the Baileys, Baileys would yeah. compromise. What on would this the Baileys issue? do, Dave? Right. 
We got to get to the Baileys yeah. and tell them to get Schumer off his ass. If you don't yeah. get to the Baileys, um, it's not going to happen. And uh, you are the Baileys like clean air. I meant to ask theoretically. You, I yeah. don't know. I haven't talked to them. That's a special connect. <laughs> Mrs. Baileys a little bit on the fence. <laughs> I think a Mrs. Baileys. Well, Mrs. Said, Bailey likes compromise. I did literally read uh, several years ago because I did. I wanted to do more Baileys background research to make fun of Chuck Schumer. And he's at a Chinese restaurant, and one of the things he's like, the Baileys don't want small cars. <laughs> The Baileys like SUVs. <laughs> I, so I that to, wasn't a positive. Don't the Baileys meant, own an entire Irish cream industry. No, no, I mean, no. They're middle class, massive people at Baileys. They, they, they don't. They my heirs to the Irish. They cream don't fortune, hate black people, but uh, uh, I want to prove that my my. You know, I reach out to the. We used uh, to call them Irish those Catholics. people. Anyways, it's, let's negotiate, no, Mr. The, President. You want any more judges confirmed? The Irish and the Jews were always good friends <laughs> down on the. Uh, um, He's off. I meant to ask you at the beginning of uh, today's uh, yes, episode sir. because uh, I feel obligated to now. Are you part of this cabal trying to push uh, Beto O'Rourke out of uh, out of contention in the primary? <laughs> Uh, no, no comment. No, um, Ooh. no, Ooh. not at all. Ooh. Where's the Perry Mason music? When Here we go. What is the cabal? Oh, it's I, I actually that's exactly, exactly what, what the you cabal say. I was on a plane. part of the cabal. That is what I would say, right? Yeah. right. Um, cabal? No, what? I was on a plane yesterday. What is cabal? I, I'm not, oh, I'm not oh sure. I see. Plausible deniability. Right. I was on a plane. Don't I, launch I the don't. first. Don't launch the first attack until I'm in the air. <laughs> Um, I was in a plane. We rally at dawn. Apparently, uh, Elizabeth Brunig uh, wrote a piece that okay. uh, that highlighted that uh, Beto O'Rourke had, uh, you know, has taken not some some not great votes, but also was involved in uh, working on a um, uh, a a pretty predatory real estate uh, business. I think in, uh, oh, in yeah. Texas, and, and um, it was also like. But I have to say, I mean, I I like it was a great piece, but it was also like. The piece that someone like me would echo in the sense that I like Beto O'Rourke. I hope he runs for Senate in Texas. I don't hate the guy. It's just it's ludicrous that people are talking about him as a contender. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the left, you have serious policy disagreements with him. I would add one addendum, and I know we've made this point before. Any conversation that's talking about a candidate that lost – uh, as a potential presidential candidate, why is Stacey Abrams not at the top of this list? In fact, I would suggest, I mean, we've talked about the pool of voters that were disenfranchised could have made up the margin she lost by. I feel comfortable calling it a stolen race. She did an incredibly impressive job. And I think especially because the people who are sort of the biggest – sort of promoters of this Beto thing are the pseudo-woke performative people that are always going to go on, on Bernie off of, like, fake identity issues. It's very bizarre that they aren't embracing Stacey Abrams, who's an incredibly impressive person, who should be in, I would say, VP, frankly. I mean, I wonder if, um, I mean, if it's a function of Stacey Abrams not necessarily. I mean, look, people are talking about Beto O'Rourke about this way because they're being encouraged to. Right. right. I mean, it's not like he's sitting there like I never it never even occurred to me. No. When people start talking about him right. as a potential candidate, it's because during the course of his campaign, um, you know, a couple of people said you're very charismatic and he raised 30 million dollars, no doubt. which is a tremendous sum for a can you know, for a, a somewhat quixotic campaign, uh, theoretically. And um, and he's promoting it. I don't know that Stacey Abrams is out there. But I think some of it is organic, though. I do. I don't think it's all. I, I think especially in social media, when people sort of pontificate about these things, I think some of it is a just. Well, like, now, wait, let me ask a couple things here. Um, you know, and I, I just can't wait for the left to eat itself throughout this entire primary. <laughs> right. I'm really excited for where this goes. But um, yeah. It's no accident that Deval Patrick decided not to run this week. Because of the Zach uh, Carter piece? No, it has nothing to do with the <laughs> Zach Carter piece. It has everything to do with the Obama world saying, you're out. We're going to clear the we're field going for Beto. Beto. No, I mean, not clear the field, but clear, we're clear going for Beto. Our, we're backing Beto. Right, okay. We're not backing you. And... Uh, I, I think that played a, a major role because, as you recall, 
there was a lot of talk about Obama World backing Deval Patrick. Deval Patrick. Yes. And uh, suddenly he decides, I'm not running this week. It was pretty early. Well, let me put it this way. I My sense would be that the 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 message that they got from the Obama world and that piece that came out, the timing is not yeah, no, coincidental. The piece was part of it, I think. Well, and no, 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 but wait a second. That, You're missing my point. No, no and the, also his it, there's real issues in terms of like – Yes, that's true. Uh, his but family. This is, and, but, but often the way these things yeah. work, okay, mm-hmm. is – Different parts of that world have different jobs to do. Right. One comes in and says, look, this You're is probably— You're not saying Zach Carter is part of Obama. World. No, yes, but he's part I'm of not Obama saying that Zach Carter is nor part was of— he, Nor is he uh, affected by anyone who, is, who would be part of Obama world saying, hey, you better write this piece. No, no, but you write the piece because you have the information, and the information starts flowing— and it starts getting out there, and uh, you know. I think the timing was interesting. I, I mean, also, but but I don't. No, I, I, I don't think, think Zach writes what Zach wants to write. No, right? of course, of course. Yeah. But 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 you know how this works with with spokespeople and communications people. They say who's going to be good to write this piece, and they look. Yeah, at but the, I don't. I don't. I just don't feel like anyone who would be in that position would that Zach Carter would be the person they would go to. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that that was – I mean, I don't do know. Do we have Zach on the phone? I don't know. I'll I don't ask know. him. Do, do you also know about the very sad, like, real thing when he was first governor of Massachusetts, how he almost resigned uh, because of his wife having some very serious, like, anxiety and depression issues? No, they, I didn't. They've written and spoken about it publicly. So I actually also think his sense of – this the toll that this could take on my family. Like I know that that's like a talking he made like point. a glancing. I don't reference think that to that's that. total BS in his case. No, I, I think, think there's all these factors. Genuine. I think I think uh, it's all these factors. All right, but but here's let's get back to a moment for uh, for Beto because uh, look, I know you're uh, on the fence here, <laughs> but let me let me just bring in Chris Matthews okay. to tell uh, you uh, yes. what you need to do. I miss um, here I is Chris Matthews. Right, here we go. Um, <laughs> This is uh, it. Really, is sort of. You're like, David Dan. You're part the, of the cabal. This is. We're going to look back on this in 60 months uh, <laughs> uh, from now, like like with fond. Is the like, thrill remember, is back? Remember the, the Beto, thrill up is Remember the is Beto back. wars. Yeah. Remember the Beto wars of 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 late 2018. Of Here we go. And we, the Democratic Party, have not given them an alternative. Let's talk about presidential politics, because I'm already thinking about 2020. I know you all are, too. CNBC is reporting that Democratic Congressman Beto O'Rourke of Texas' team has been fielding calls from senior operatives who worked on President Barack Obama's campaign in the pivotal states of Iowa and New Hampshire. As speculation continues about a a potential presidential run by Beto in 2021 columnist at the Washington Post is already questioning whether the Democratic rising star of Beto O'Rourke is far enough left for the party. Elizabeth Brunig writes, we still have time to pick a politician with a bold, clear, distinctively progressive aid agenda and an articulate vision beyond something better than this. The literal translation of hope change campaigning. Better is a lot like Obama. True. It's perhaps time for left-leaning Democrats to realize that may not be a good thing. P- Peter, I'm amazed by this. Here's a guy who has a elect- power. People like him. He's got charisma like Obama. And he had somebody on the, on, I guess, on the left saying he's not left enough. Well, there's a but explain that. There's an amazing, wonderful blue collar philosopher who once said naivete in children is often charming. In adults, it's stupidity. That's political Ugh. stupidity. For that person to write about antipathy towards Wall Street, oil and gas, welfare reform, those are all major issues that we need a president to deal with, not to simply scorn them and discard them. And second, I think Beto's in an incredible position, not necessarily about the presidency, but he's captured energy. And one of the failings of the Obama um, the campaign in 08 was that after we won, we never had a call to service. And I think Beto and his team are figuring out where do you take all that Bring energy. Bring people, get people in the act. Uh, let me go to Ashley on this. I don't it seems know who to me that, that was. If the I, don't, Democratic pause Party- it. I don't know who that was, but I have a feel. He, it doesn't feel like he's like got the, his fingers on the pulse. They just found like some accountant in New Jersey. They're like, hey, you want to be by the way, asshole on Chris uh, Matthews' show? By sure. the way, so Trump beat Clinton in Texas by nine points. Beto comes within, was it two, three? Three. Trump lost by two points nationally. Democrats won uh, in 2018 by eight points. Right. It's the same swing. It's the same spread. 
There's it's no, the exact words, same spread. He did not outperform. No, he performed exactly the, as well as, as everybody else. else. Right, exactly. Yeah, but and, he's so inspiring. Not like that boring <laughs> Obama guy. Well, the, you know what I noticed about those posters? Do you see it? What? That's the exact. Those Beto posters are identical to Obama's posters in 2004. The Viva Beto? No. In 04. Yes. The, the Senate poster... Is I have one of those from from 2004. And it's up in your room, uh, it is, above your bed. It is above my bed. I look at it every on night on the ceiling. Uh, change. It's, it, it's still possible if I move the O <laughs> over here and I take out this part of the B. It's Beto. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's very similar, like just that big lettering up mm. there um, at, at the top of the the, the sign, but. Um, all right. Well, is there more sound here? Yeah. Let Let's keep playing it. I don't know who this guy is. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a more Kondraki. Somebody call off. in or write in. Yeah. They is. just took him off like the LIR or something. In the act, uh, let me go to ask you on this. It seems to me that if the Democratic Party sets as a standard, you must be Bernie. In mm-hmm. other words, a, a, a vowed socialist. I'm not knocking it, but if, right. you, if that's the political goal line you're setting up, if this person isn't for so-called Medicare for everybody all life, if they're not for free tuition payback, if they're not for all these social programs, if they're not for a big role for the government and the economy, then they're not Democrats. If that's the standard, you're going to knock out a lot of candidates. Well, let's look at this, though. The DNC... Now, pause it. Hold on. Let me just, just say this. I think that Elizabeth Brunig... Um, Sitting atop of where she sits, choosing who gets to be Democrats is wrong. <laughs> I don't know who gave her this power, but I mean, is, should anybody have that power? I, probably not. I don't even think that she... Yeah. Uh, she all right. If that's the standard, you're going to knock out a lot of candidates. Well, let's look at this, though. The DNC itself was against Bernie Sanders, and they set parameters to make sure that he would not get enough support and not have the support he needed. And let's go back to superdelegates and all of that. So I do think the establishment in the Democratic Party will not allow someone too progressive to get back in. What about the voters? So now here's here's the interesting piece. So you've got to get to to the suburban, middle-class, blue-collar voters and they need to start thinking about that That's Obama really Trump concerns. flip that the happened in 2016. Blue collar voters. Middle class blue collar voters. Wait, who are those the, guys? The, the Westchester County folks who just go over to the the the, the car factory they out in, in Westchester they County. They in Briarcliff Manor. <laughs> they make a half million a year and they drive up state to work in Rochester. <laughs> what? What? What is who are the suburban <laughs> Blue class, middle class, blue collar workers. It's like as he grabbed his macchiato. There are on six his of them, and they are highly, highly influential. We have them all here on our right. list, and so we know them. they're in we, this this panel right now. This blue I ribbon know panel. Who it is. It's the Baileys. Yeah, it's um, all right, let, let's continue on. Middle class, blue collar. You've got to get. You Trump? You've got to get to the suburban, middle class, right. blue collar voters, and they need to start thinking about that Obama Trump flip that happened in 2016. That again flipped right. in 2018. Oh, if you do not focus on that, which they're moderate swing voters. Their ears to, uh, I'm not going to vote ears. for a I am completely. I would vote for a Joe Biden, not a Beto. Okay, Obama. how do you get the people in the industrial states who flip from a, from Trump to the Democratic candidates for pre, for senator and governor in Michigan with? Wisconsin, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, right. the whole. I know. I totally agree. It's like she's only talking about the primary, which is one thing. But it's right. let's move on to the general You're election. You know what they used to say back in the 60s? <laughs> What's NBC, that? NBC, November doesn't count. <laughs> the hard left would say, as long as we win the primaries, it doesn't matter. George McGovern. But that mentality's out there, Peter. It's out there now. George I just saw in the paper um, today. Wow. They should the, definitely the, still bro- be afraid the, of right. the McGovern Nixon It's too much like Obama. That's a at problem. At least 100,000 yeah. people he wanted that are still alive. Yeah. Wait. Okay. Um, yeah. The the oh it is well, but this is going to be McGovern, right? This is this is generational. I mean, this is what has been problematic with the Democrats for a long time is that the baby boomers still hold because of the size of their uh, of their generation still hold too much sway over essentially the the convention the the, the common wisdom, the conventional wisdom, and you know the idea that you can draw any parallels now between George McGovern and anybody in like, right. like, like there's no, it is. Well, I mean, to draw a parallel with George <clears throat> McGovern, you have to find a candidate who is broadly seen on the anti-war left 
who was hated by unions. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. like who is that can't parallel today? With, with reason, too, right? He was the one who cut the union's power uh, out from under them and picking who... Um, well, through. I mean, it was a little bit more complicated. Unions he, were strongly pro-war at that point. George no, Meany himself was a little uh, bit of an overstatement. He tried. He was so pro-labor. He tried so hard to get the unions on his side, and they just totally That's snubbed correct. him. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not. It, it, it's no, not what, that he was anti. Is the unions were where he strongly went against him. bad was he? His reaction to it led him to later in his career do like anti-card check propaganda, which is a really <laughs> well. But it's an interesting comparison, right? Because the things that sank. McGovern back then were very, very different from the things that um, the centrists are saying would sink Bernie right now. Right. Um, it, a lot of things that sunk McGovern with the socially conservative unions were things that every Democrat supports now, things known as identity politics, right? Yeah. Uh, minority rights, gay marriage, drug laws, anti-war, etc. Whereas, uh, a- and their economic policies were actually very much in line with his. Um, and uh, now but, it's the economic policies. Amnesty, acid, abortion. Yeah, now it's Bernie the economic policies that they're saying are too, uh, too left. So it's yeah. like really a bad comparison. As long as Bernie doesn't pick a vice presidential uh, nominee who was treated for clinical depression, I, I think he'll right, be fine. Right, right, right. Um, um, now, we should also say that, um, that I, I think part of the animosity came from the, the commission that McGovern co-chaired to... That that changed the way that our 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 our, our primaries ran. I mean, they actually created primaries as opposed to right. a back room where unions had a tremendous amount of power in basically picking who the nominee was. Um, so That's true. But without, I'm totally bummed. I really thought that Chris Matthews was going to develop a crush on AOC and become a democratic socialist. She's got it. I totally lost it. Well, I thought he was so, just going to be like, I mean, this is the problem with oligarchs. But but what's <laughs> this is the, what's what's <laughs> What's fascinating to me, well, I guess it's not that fascinating to me. I mean, the idea that, like, <laughs> like the, like, we, off. Yeah, that's a good are, setup. I think it's fascinating. Aren't we? Aren't yeah. we? Aren't is it or isn't it? Well, I mean, I should know better at this point. Like, it should be completely boring to me. Oh, you that, actually would expect better than that? No, from these it's just, oh, okay. I don't believe, like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. the idea that they, the, the, um, there are folks who are willing to already sort of like, who think they're playing this poorly is my point is the 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 forces that want a Beto are playing this poorly because they are polarizing too early. <laughs> it just way seems to me too early. It, it, like it is way too early to sort of like complain about uh, about the idea that there are people who are pointing to Beto's record and saying, "Hey, these are this is problematic." What you should be doing is you push back on his record. You should be building him instead I mean, I'll, of. I'll help him. Uh, you know, there, there's there's one vote that uh, I've seen put out there that a work vote of some financial deregulation vote that that bill never became law. That the, 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 the vote that is being pointed to is something that was just one of the many deregulatory measures that the House passed uh, that, that never got through the Senate. The one that did, the deregulatory bank bill, the one big bipartisan bank deregulation bill this year, Beto voted against it. Uh, so just do that instead of presuming a cabal. Though, They're scared. They're though. scared, man. I think actually it's but it's funny. He, it's surprising to me too because I think there's actually a lot of people like me who obviously will support Bernie over Beto because we're left. But like I have no particular antipathy or hostility to him at all, and they're fast tracking. That's like, what uh, I'm saying. Yeah, no, I'm talking totally completely right. from a stra- strategic totally right. standpoint. Right. right, this is right. not the time where you you set this up. Totally. You set up this this because it's not going to be helpful. Totally, it, you know, like it, you know, it's not. It certainly wasn't helpful. During uh, the 2016 uh, primaries, and, it, it, and 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 those forces are not as well situated as they were then, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's a big mistake. Although Beto's a better candidate, than it's Hillary. a big Ooh, mistake. Yes, I just like but, but my point is yes. But my yeah. point is, you don't want to make this about 
the so-called Bernie Bros no, no, versus these, Beto. They're doing it more they're doing than, it than, than others are. I mean, Elizabeth Bernick said uh, already, she said, it, we're already at that time where I think I forget how she, I mean, there was a couple of other things, but she's like, we're already at that time where I'm a white male magically. Right. Like, well, she's like we're not even like in the friggin' election cycle yet and all this garbage. Is my my biggest problem was with uh, Maloney. And uh, Beto sort of coming in, I think he endorsed Maloney in the New York AG race, if I remember correctly. Oh, Sean Patrick Maloney. Yes. Oh, that yeah, that's trash. And, move. and, and that, that hurts makes me nervous Yeah. as to what, like, something's, like, all that low-key stuff. What's make, what makes me nervous is that the, it's still 2018 on the calendar, and right. we're already at each other's throats. What makes me nervous is he well, comes from a family Well, but that's my point. Is like, I, don't, I, I think, like, they're escalating. I, I, I mean, I think like Neera Tandon escalated this in a useless, silly way. Do we put up? Uh, yeah, the, that's what she Yeah, put does. it back up. Put it back up. I mean, well, I understand, but but somebody should. Somebody, there should be somebody well, I, the truth in that is, world is who that says everyone's like, hey, still fighting the 2016 prime. But I felt like that stuff. It sort of had nope. No. Have you been everyone's on Twitter still lately? Fighting the well, well and Neera Tandon is on the front lines of the 2016. Yeah, she needs the law. Yeah, the war of 2016. Yeah, she should get offline. Maybe sure. it's, it's like it's like when Andrew Jackson in eighteen fourteen was still <laughs> fighting that battle of the eight, war of eighteen twelve. Like he's still, she's still fighting the war of twenty sixteen. I know it. She's she like always will she's be. like one of the uh, the people in the hills in Japan that hasn't right, heard right, that right, World right, War Two exactly. is World over. Yeah. Except nineteen yeah. seventy five, has... they find right. the guy he's in a cave. Yeah, <laughs> except that guy would still like be running a division position of the Japanese yeah, in military. a position of power. That's the problem. Well, maybe right. running propaganda up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If, right. If I may, maybe it's time for the hard left to flex its muscles a little bit and remind the people in the political class that uh, and in the ruling class that the Elizabeth Brunig option, the Bernie option, that is a nice option. People are angry. And if we don't get what we want uh, in the electoral sphere or even if we do. Uh, we're going to have some widespread unrest outside of it. Well, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen on Twitter. I don't think that's that a is. place for that. To, uh, no, I mean, certainly uh, not. But, you know, maybe have a wildcat strike or two. Put the fear of God in them. I'm Only the left is so weak that that's strikes. probably not going to happen. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just... It's just what we're but what we're talking about here has nothing to do with people who would do a wildcat strike. It has only to do with like what the political class is doing. I mean, has, this is has just nothing silly. to do with people's lives. Yes, I would nothing. argue. Yeah, like, exactly, uh, exactly. You know, and we, just a, we just talked about it. We just talked about this bank that uh, uh, was you know doing bad credit report uh, reporting. Uh, on thousands of people, and, and you know, what does this there, have to do? Well, no, they but still view real policy. I mean, I just they, have to say, like, I would say, like, and I'm pro Bernie, whatever. But isn't it really clear that I mean, if, uh, specifically on the issues you're talking about, I mean, I think Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are definitely the only candidates that I would absolutely trust on that. I think type Sherrod of Brown issue. is pretty oh, and good Sherrod on Brown stuff like runs. that. And Sherrod Brown, but those three, uh, what I'm Merkley, is, I think it's pretty. He's good not on, running. I'm like, talking about is candidate. he not? They I have not still, heard he's running. That would be interesting. Mer- if, they're uh, still trying to. Merkley has talked about running. I, right. We have thirty-four, to my count, Democrats that have talked about running in wow. a serious way. Jesus well, Christ! They're still trying to portray Bernie as exhausting. this like hard left socialist, this extremist, and like the furthest left option that exists. When in fact he is a very moderate. Uh, compromiser, as far as I'm concerned. I'll tell well, you what we should. But, ta- we but should I think he's Chris not. But I think you have to concede that within the context of American politics, Bernie Sanders is to the left of any candidate who people think actually has a chance of winning the nomination. Yeah, sure. I but mean, the things he's proposing are not actually socialism. They're just common sense social democratic policies that every other country in the developed world has. I'll and say one thing. the more they sh- can make him look crazy, the more they drag that window like of possibility window they look back crazy over to the by right. Saying he looks crazy. Yeah, I feel now. like that window it all has backfires. been shot because the, the play of the smart ones, and this, this is a difference between Obama and Clinton people. It's really mm-hmm. subtle. Obama people get, oh, 
we should pretend to be closer to that. Right. The Clinton people are we're like, that's crazy, and he's a white supremacist. Yeah, right. Obama's like, nuts. we're listening. Yeah, the Obama people are like, oh, that's a really good point. Right. We're, we're for, like, universal Medicare well, that's, actuary that, th- this is access. What, this is what I find. Uh, okay, yeah. so this is what I find so strange about what's going on now. And maybe it's just rogue, you know, sort of Clintonites who are just mad about Bernie and mad about certain people. Yes, there is. The the nice. point that you're making is that the Obama people are going to dress Beto up 100%. as if he's like I'm like practically a younger Bernie. They're gonna send right. him to the Wildcat strike on his skateboard. Right, oh exactly. God. And, and <laughs> how do you do, fellow leftists? Absolutely. And and I think and I think I think, you know, to the extent that Neera Tandon had a point about people being worried, I think there is a worry on the left that people are going to project onto Beto positions and a philosophy that he doesn't necessarily have. I, I'm looking forward to uh, O'Rourke getting his band together for a remake of Fight Song. There, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Don't even speak that into existence. But, but do, do people energy, remember bro. at the beginning of this campaign, at uh, the beginning of, of, of his senatorial campaign, you heard a lot of like, look, he's not. As progressive as he appears, he did hear that originally. and he's a Texas uh, congressman, he's a t- he's but he's, he's from yeah. Texas, yeah. and he, you know him. he's Fairly. you know and and left. the the you know there is a lot of sense on the left that Obama a lot of people projected stuff onto Obama that was not there that people did not realize that he was not an ideologue. Boy, at, we haven't fallen into that trap again. But, <laughs> well, I mean, what do you mean? With, I mean, I, I I feel like what you're saying that that he's sort of a blank slate. Yeah, and, and people are projecting. Oh, your wishes yeah. and desires. And, and, to and be white people. what's happening now is I think you're getting people to say like, look, don't project. Right. <laughs> and right. you know, uh, and because yeah, people my, are pissed. Yeah, I don't hate Beto, but that's just my st- like. I actually kind of like him, but the, I just want to be very clear that this guy is not if you're if you're interested in a progressive candidate this is not your pick if he be yeah That's if he it. becomes the eventual nominee i want it, his liabilities to be known and articulated as being right. on the left yeah exactly like what does it say about the democratic party that they even need to have a progressive caucus in the first place like that isn't a, the party supposed party. to be progressive it's a, tent, it's a coalition well, it's party a, yeah i mean it's a it's a big party i mean it's uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else. I, I, I would say that, um, you know, in thinking about the role of the the left in, in, in you know, this, this next cycle, it, it might be wiser rather than staking out a position of supporting one candidate above all else – might issue be wiser sense. to support uh, certain issues and demand totally. that every candidate uh, uh, move toward them. Totally. He is a, he is, that would certainly, be, institutions that would certainly put us in a better position uh, after the election should a Democrat be elected to continue that. Vote. Absolutely. That's what the Bernie people are doing, but people keep accusing us of having That's what the Green New Deal is all about. But, right? but, but, but the point is, the, you you you're i mean if you analyze that statement the bernie people are doing this the it's, people who support bernie support him not because I, of who I'm he saying, is but no, no, because but, but, of the policy my point that is he like represents. look at look at what aoc is doing on the green new deal she right. is she has said we need this this uh particular committee because we have this crisis out there and we need to build legislation for it and we need to go around to every member of congress now no matter who they are or or, or who supported them whatever, and said, are you going to support this this Green New Deal commission? And she's got like 20 of them already in the space before she's a congressman, in the space of a, space of a week or yep. two, to support it. And, and that seems to be, that's to me, to be the organizing principle on the But that's different than the picking left. your presidential candidate. No, it isn't. It, it's saying, no, literally we, have, one. we have 10 candidates here. Are you going to support? This is what was done on health care uh, in... in uh, and and without as much participation on the left, and so we got the health care yep. we got. Uh, it was what was done on uh, you. You build consensus, and 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 you say that that this is a threshold issue. But there are two. The only two roadblocks to that are. I mean, first of all, I think. I mean, of course, generically and generally, that's true. And then it's like, okay, I am generic. And, and uh, no, no, I mean, it's true. It's of course you're right. But I think that, like, okay, so. 
the thing that I keep hitting with Bernie is like no one is on the near him on those consensus issues on foreign policy. That matters to me what your position on Brazil is, what your position on uh, Yemen or the Iran deal is or Israel. It matters to me. I don't think it's and so that's number one. He's still far ahead of the rest of them. And then number two, I think you have to decide at some point, like, do you really trust somebody's, you know, of those relative choices, I trust Bernie just even in terms of who he'll appoint to oversee Wall Street as a, as a as an example. Or Warren, I trust her too, far more than I do trust uh, Cory Booker as an example. By the example. way, what, what Warren did in 2016 was uh, create this, this idea of personnel as policy. Right. And she pinned down. That's great. Clinton on on who she was That's going great. to appoint. That's great. And and tried to disqualify certain people who were in Clinton's orbit for appointments. So, I mean, there are ways to go about this that aren't the, just but at personality point, driven. But, but, yes, but I didn't the, say anything about personality. No, but no, yeah. but no, but 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 the idea is that instead of what I think what 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 David is suggesting is instead of starting with the person and assessing their issues. You come up with an issue set and you push those issues and you let people fall in line and then you start to assess, okay, have they adopted this position? Do I trust them? Now, you're also talking like we may have nine months, 12 months, 14 months to make these people say it over and over and over in public in such a way that it's like it doesn't matter if you trust them or not. Like they're, they're you know, right. they're, you know. Some obviously are within a certain zone, but the idea being that um, why the the what makes what they what the the near attendants are doing now a mistake is they are people they are forcing people to pick candidates much earlier than they should be. Yeah, they're short circuiting that whole process. They're short circuiting that whole process. Look, I can and assure on the left, you that, that can happen on that Bernie process. Bernie Sanders too. comes out and he goes, "I want more settlements in the West Bank." And Lula should be in jail and privatize Social Security. I will not continue but to support even, Bernie Sanders. I mean, I think that, like, of, of course, I that, actually think a lot of people, especially that was the sort of distinguishing marker of Bernie's campaign was actually people being more policy oriented. Yeah. And I understand that people per, I get that people were, there's personality cults around everybody. I get it. But that's I mean, first of all, it that applies just as easily to Hillary Clinton or Beto. But if you're really seriously talking about policy, there's major differences here. And there is also a background of credibility that people have and other people don't have. I mean, this is not that really – it seems pretty obvious. Yeah, and it's not just about their platform in the moment, right? Like we've heard everything before. We've heard so much progressive talk from so many people from, you know, Bill Clinton to Obama. Like I want to see what they've done in the past. And Bernie has been bashing away at this stuff for decades, hey, like we know where he we know where he stands versus, you know, if like a Hillary type candidate came out and said, oh, yeah, uh, Medicare for all is a great idea. And then you look at what they've done in the past, like people might not trust them. I, I mean, it's true. I mean, I but uh, that said, uh, people uh, definitely uh, changed uh, based upon the, the situation. I mean, I think Bernie is probably softer on guns than he was. Um, uh, five ten years ago. Yeah, well, yeah, you're. They're really. Well, I mean, I mean look, I mean, I, well, I know it's not your issue, but that's not what we're talking about. They're for, we're talking about a dynamic. Yeah, they're foreclosing on the uh, like the uh, of the availability to make Beto a better candidate over all this, right? By short circuiting all this immediately, because it's not right. like that's uh, true. Uh, hey, Matthews's complaint wasn't that people are cultists about Bernie; it was that they're doing purity tests around issues like Medicare for everybody, right? Stuff, right? Exactly. Right. Well, and so exactly. he's stopping this process, and that's what all these people are doing, right? I mean, that's why you got to focus on the on the on the issue and not make it associated with the personnel at this point. But there is going like, to be a certain point when you're like, okay, yes, I know. I'm but in 2018, the idea. Is Bernie not, Sanders. The, the to idea do this is not throughout 2019. Yeah, the, the idea no, in 2018, 2019 to is not to start to apply the test. It is to create the test. Sure. And then, if the test is created, sure. then people are in a position to be to, to fail it or or, or succeed um, uh, in, in that extent. Try right, to get well, pulled in directions. Uh, um, of course. Let's talk about this for a moment because this is a, this is a great interview, uh, Chris Hayes. I, 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 you're on like five minutes. Okay, good. This will be, we'll, this will be the last we'll thing that we'll have you for. Let's. Um, uh, we mentioned North Carolina. 
even Chris Kobach apparently now uh, is recognizing there could be something wrong with the election in, uh, in, in North Carolina. <laughs> what are Democrats uh, trying to steal? Ninth uh, district. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and came. That's so the problem. Chris Hayes had on uh, his program, I guess it was last night, the North Carolina Republican executive director. This is Dallas Woodhouse. Is he Leighton Woodhouse's uh, brother or something like that? Or, or no, like, no, 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 different guy. I got it. Um, Who's the, that? Uh, well, there is like two brothers, but uh, no, that's Brad Woodhouse. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Who are the Woodhouses? So, uh, the, uh, like a brother team that it's are on different sides. Yeah, they, it's they, a hard, they're it's on opposite like a, sides. Ma- political Maitland, divide. Maitland uh, oh, uh, Carvel type of situation. Got it, got it. All right. Well, anyway, so uh, Chris Hayes had on last night the uh, North Carolina Republican Executive Director, um, and remember the Republican Party in North Carolina has basically, I don't know what the numbers are, hundreds of, 100,000 some odd um, have kept people off the voting rolls, have uh, depressed uh, voter turnout, all ostensibly based upon voter fraud. And this is the only real case that they've ever found. And this is not voter fraud. It is electoral fraud. Here is uh, Hayes. I do want to uh, cite something you said in the days after the election where you said uh, in a phone call, we are trying to keep Democrats from stealing the congressional race from Mark Harris. Now, that's obviously an incredibly loaded charge uh, that you made. Do you want to apologize for that or take that back? Or just change the name? Well, no, because I made that call uh, to donors of the North Carolina Republican Party, which you're not one of, I, I feel sure. But if you'd like to be, we're at 1506 Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. No, but I, I think this. But you were wrong, I right? I mean, you, you, your, your position was this is a sort of made-up scandal, and the Democrats are out to try to steal this out from under our noses. We won 905 votes. They're, they're refusing to concede. That proved to be wrong, right? I mean, you get out over your skis. There was actual, apparently, criminal activity. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what I would say is, is you know, there are a lot of different things going on here. The ground is shifting under our feet. You know, I, I don't sure think is. you can excuse the Democrats on the state board of elections that all of a sudden drop this on our lap after no election protest was filed, after Mr. McCready conceded the election, after no recount was called for, and after all of the local boards of elections certified the race. We have never seen that Wait happen. a second, though. Wait a second. And, and, and sir, if I, can just, if I can just finish this one point, I, I apologize. Will let you. And, and at the same time, the state is engaged in a very difficult negotiation and fight over the control of the board of elections. That I know. And so the, the, the and, and so the board of elections that's walking out the door simply comes out and says they're not going to certify, and at that time, really don't say right. why. Okay. I mean, of course, we're going to be suspicious that's a, of that. That's a I mean, process complaint. They, Let's put that to the. <laughs> you imagine this guy going like, "You didn't find." That the money was missing from the bank until they had gotten away in the gotaway car and they'd already crossed the bridge and paid their toll. And then all of a sudden they got to come back. It's I'll, called Lily Ledbetter. Right? What's it? I mean, that, that's right. what, right. that is exactly what the court said in the Lily Ledbetter case. Lily Ledbetter was a woman who was uh, discriminated against on pay for 20 years. Yep. And uh, she found out about it years later and said, I want my back pay. I was doing the same job with this other guy, and he was making all this more money than me. And the court said, well, you didn't find out about it in time, so we're, we're, we're not going to do anything. And, they, 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 and Congress had to change the, the law. law. Yeah. So, so timeliness is a thing, but I don't know that it's a thing in this context— when there's obviously fraud. And well, it's when the Board of Elections did not yet. certify like, the race. That's the point, right? The certification is supposed to be like, we have nowhere. cleared the deck of all the, uh, the potential like rampant fraud that could have existed. And, oh, we found some before the certification. Right. Like, I mean, it's one thing to say, like, okay, you serve your two years, and then, you know, three years from now, uh, they right. go, hey, wait a second. There was right. some... Or even when right. they're a sitting congressperson. Yeah, I think but, that the statute of limitations has not run out if when the, they haven't the race certified. has not been certified at all. <laughs> That's the whole point right. of the certification. Right. Um, but his, his arguments were sort of, well, I was lying to my donors, not everybody. I know, I like that. Like, <laughs> and I almost got away with it. Just doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> Man, what do you want? You want to give me some money? And I'm I don't a know. propagandist. That's Why right. I, look, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a paid hack. You hit me for cut this. a check. I won't lie on your show. Right. I mean, what do you... <laughs> Bear shits in the woods. I don't know what to tell you. That's how you talk to donors. I don't yeah. know what you want from me. 
Um, people buy Alex Jones pills, Chris. What the hell do you think? Well, uh, David, Dan, it has been a real honor and pleasure to have you in studio. Always to be good in uh, the Cedar Auditorium. There we go. Here. Yes, in the massive. Yes. Uh, yeah, you can see that we actually yep. did put some, have some fans the up rafters. in the third balcony. Um, but uh, David, uh, thank you much uh, for for coming on. Uh, I hope uh, most everyone, I think, uh, who listens to this program has uh, purchased your book, uh, Chain of Title. <laughs> Very good. Um, and good to hear. They can find you. Uh, wh- where do you like to send people to your uh, Tumblr or? Uh, sure. So uh, davidan.tumblr. And your tiny letter. You and tell people yeah, about your tiny letter dot com slash david dan is my bi-weekly to twice a week newsletter uh that only twice uh, a week usually twice a week okay. uh mm-hmm. that includes links to everything i uh write about you know and there's a, a little bit more theory going around um <laughs> yes. on this program that uh, you don't actually exist <laughs> that uh, well i've, I've you're, disproven you're just, that well you're no, just the guy they might, send in they still have a team <laughs> in India they send you in are you out. saying i'm a crisis actor i mean look <laughs> I've noticed you've had Milo I've noticed you had headset on the whole time you've been here. That's true. You could be just somebody's like I'm a replicant. Is one what of, you're saying? Well, I'm saying Isn't there could be a guy in a Milo? van down <laughs> right. in the street, you know, listening to the show, feeding you information as part of the team. Talk it's about there. CFPB. They're all they're all <laughs> typing away. There's in the like computers. this Cyrano de Bergerac situation. Yeah, he's like a, you're he's the about. suave, personable, handsome face of a shady collective. <laughs> exactly. Like there's a Soros funded like traveling uh, van out there with like. <laughs> 14 uh, reporters, uh, the communications van, and they're just the guy they send out to actually front it. We're going to see David well, in like a fair a, cop. We're going right. to see him in an IBM Watson commercial or something. Like that. <laughs> they found Dane at some Deep bar. Deep blue. Yeah. It's like, you know what uh, postal banking is? Nah. You're going to learn it. <laughs> yeah, now that I'm off the show, I can do it with my normal accent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is like the born identity. <laughs> All right, David Dayan, thank you so much. (laughs) All right, folks, uh, we're going to take a break, head into the fun half. A reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You become a member of this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. It is your membership that uh, keeps this show uh, humming along. Uh, Folks, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Um, The good news is you still have maybe a week or two to buy tickets to uh, the Brooklyn Podfest. When I said that, when I said you may have a week or two, I'm going to show you what Brendan did. Like this. He did one of those where he shook his head back and forth and was like, I wouldn't promise that. Um, we are now down below to what? One quarter of the seats left? Uh, a little bit less. less. Yeah. A little bit less. If you want to purchase a ticket, to see the Majority Report live on January 13th at the Bell House, you need to do so very, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can head over to majority.fm. Uh, you will get details there. Uh, pick up your tickets. Also, there's been some confusion. For the next couple of, uh, like, next week or so, you can purchase justcoffee.coop coffee. For 30% off, you do not need to use a coupon code MAJORITY. You do not need to do that. They're having a special promo, 30% off. This is the time where you go there and you buy the Majority Report blend because you've never tried it before. And you want to see if it's as good as we've been saying it is because it is. Free shipping, 30% off. Buy a five-pound bag if you're smart. Um, unless you're like one of those people who are like, I have to have my coffee like incredibly fresh. Mm. I can't have a five-pound bag. Or if you own a store, uh, there, there you go. Boom. Uh, so check that out. Uh, Michael? February 1st, Bell House, Michael Brooks Show. Uh, tickets, uh, we're at the halfway point. And uh, with uh, February 1st coming around the bend, so uh, get those tickets quickly as well. Michael Brooks Show uh, on Patreon, patreon.com slash TMBS to get everything. Our YouTube channel uh, and iTunes Thanks. Who was on uh, this week? This past week, Mike Racine was on. Very funny comedian. We did a lot of uh, Dave Rubin impressions. He has a great <laughs> Dave Rubin impression. Does he really? He really legitimately yeah, figured has it a out. great Dave Rubin impression. He caught it. He said he's a South Park character. Yeah, you'd need to do and him he, like a South Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, what, that, that's interesting. Yeah, did you see? I mean, she's <laughs> <seen> the ideas. <laughs> he nailed it. 
Uh, we had a great time. George H.W. More like George H.W. Bad was the title. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, Matt Taibbi in studio. Oh, I should also say, um, uh, Jamie, we'll talk about the Antifada, but I want to just do this in the uh, fun half of the program. I am holding a mug. I think I have an idea who gave it to me. Um, for uh, Hanukkah, I guess it was a Hanukkah mug. Uh, it says, ask the moms, and then a tiny majority dot FM uh, right there. So uh, Ronald Reagan, I think, was responsible for this. Maybe, maybe. Ask the moms. <laughs> Ask the mom. It could have been. It could have been. But I think uh, he's already got these up at his uh, um, uh, uh, redirected, uh, like a seamless page or whatever. I don't know what a threadless or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But um, yeah, he said uh, something was on the way, and I was a little bit worried. And uh, he was like, don't worry, it's practical. I know that you need a practical gift. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? Yeah, so this week on the Antifada, uh, out now, Sean and I recap our magical trip to Mexico, including our visit to the autonomous Zapatista community of Oventique. <laughs> and we talk about the, that's uh, oh, very nice, the uh, amazing experience we had there and the beautiful way they govern their society along horizontalist principles um also this weekend we are recording an episode with justin akers chacon author of a book called radicals in the barrio magonistas socialists wobblies and communists in the mexican american working class and it was partially inspired by the bad take that uh, angela nagel Published that made everyone mad a couple weeks ago, but it, it's something I'd been meaning to do for a while. So, so you waited till Michael went to the bathroom before he said that. <laughs> oh, uh, is he in the bathroom? <laughs> I didn't Matt, notice. Matt, uh, tonight, finally, uh, me and my friend Chris are going to talk about democracy in chains. I know. We're going to talk about uh, James Buchanan and if he's sort of like a libertarian Machiavelli or if he's a libertarian Forrest Gump. The, wow, nice. All right. Um, all right. Quick break. Oh, wait. Have we started on... Uh, Brendan, are we on um, uh, Pandora yet? I believe so. You the yeah, well. folks. Uh, if you ever... Um, well, we're on Pandora. If you want to check out... Uh, if you have Pandora, check out the Majority Report. I think we just... Uh, one, of the, one of the early um, invitees onto uh, Pandora. Just us and NPR and some of the other little We're taking players. taking them down. Some of the little players. I think we could be one of the few independent yeah. news uh, podcasts on Pandora. Show them. Get our see, numbers yeah, up see, if you got let's it. Let's see NPR uh, do um, uh, a show on, you know, postal banking as like the most exciting part of the episode. I mean, the people I've talked to Try. that have worked at NPR are all jealous of the type of content we get to do here. So Is that right? Mm-hmm. Boom. All right, uh, quick break, head into the fun half. We'll be right back. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous? You're a little bit uh, upset? You're riled up? Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. 
Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly.